The Nun's Priest's Tale Once, long ago, there dwelt a poor old widow in a small cottage by a little meadow, beside a grove and standing in a dale. This widow woman, of whom I tell my tale, since the sad day when last she was a wife, had led a very patient, simple life. She had Little she had in capital or rent, but still, by making do with what God sent, she kept herself and her two daughters going. Three hefty sows, no more, were all her sowing. Three cows as well. There was a sheep called Molly, city her hall, her kitchen melancholy, and there she ate full many a slender meal. There was no sauce picante to spice her veal, no dainty morsel ever passed her throat. According to her cloth she cut her coat, repletion never left her in disquiet, and all her physic was a temperate diet, hard work for exercise, and heart's content, and rich man's gout did nothing to prevent her dancing, apoplexy struck her not, she drank no wine, nor white nor red hot had got. Her board was mostly served with white and black, milk and brown bread, in which she found no lack. Broiled bacon or an egg or two were common. She was, in fact, a sort of dairy woman. She had a yard that was enclosed about by stockade and a dry ditch without, in which she kept a cock called Chanticleer. In all the land for crowing he'd no peer. His voice was jollier than the organ blowing. In church on Sunday, he was great at crowing, far, far more regular than any clock or abbey bell, the crowing of this cock. The equanical wheel and its position at each ascent he knew by intuition, at every hour fifteen degrees of movement, he crowed so well there could be no improvement. His comb was redder than fine coral, tall and battlemented like a castle wall. His bill was black and shone as bright as jet, like azure were his legs, and they were set on azure toes with nails of lily white, like burnished gold his feathers flaming bright. This gentle cock was master in some measure of seven hens, all there to do his pleasure. They were his sisters and his paramours, colored like him in all particulars. She was the lovely she with the loveliest dyes upon her throat was known as gracious lady pertolote courteous she was discreet and debonair companionable too and took such care in her deportment since she was seven days old she held the heart of chanticleer controlled locked up securely in her every limb oh such happiness his love to him and such joy it was to hear them sing, as when the glorious sun began to spring, in sweet accord my love is far from land, for in those far-off days I understand all birds and animals could speak and sing. Now it befell, as dawn began one spring, when Chanticleer and Pertolote and all his wives were perched in this poor widow's hall, fair Pertolote, was next him on the perch. This Chanticleer began to groan and lurch, like someone sorely troubled by a, gr by a dream. And Pertolote, who heard him roar and scream, was quite aghast and said, Oh, dearest heart, what's ailing you? Why do you groan and start? Fie, what a sleeper. What a noise you make. Madam, he said, I beg you not to take offense. But by the Lord, I had a dream. So terrible just now I had to scream. I can, st I still can feel my heart racing from fear. God turn my dream to good and guard all here and keep my body out of durance vale. Out of durance vile, I dreamt that roaming up and down a while, within our yard I saw a kind of beast, a sort of hound that tried or seemed at least to try and seize me, would have killed me dead. His color was a blend of yellow and red, his ears and tail were tipped with sable fur, unlike the rest. He was a russet cur. Small was his snout. His eyes were glowing bright. It was enough to make one die of fright. 
there, that was no doubt what made me groan and swoon. For, sh for shame, she said, you timorous poltroon! Alas, what cowardice! By God above, you forfeited my heart and lost my love. I cannot love a coward, come what may, for certainly, whatever we may say, all women long, and oh, that it might be, for husbands tough, dependable, and free, secret, discreet, no niggard, not a fool, that boasts, and then will find his courage cool, at every trifling thing, by God above, how dare you say for shame, and to your love, that anything at all was to be feared, have you no manly heart to match your beard, and can a dream reduce you to such terror, dreams are a vanity, God knows, pure error, dreams are engendered in the two replete from vapors in the belly which compete with others too abundant swollen tight no doubt the redress of your dream tonight comes from the superfluity and force of the red co collar in your blood of course that is what puts a dreamer in the dread of crimson arrows fires flaming red of great red monsters making us to fight him and big red whelps and little ones to bite him. Just so the black and melancholy vapors will set a sleeper shrieking, cutting capers, and swearing that black bears, black bulls as well, or blackest fiends are hauling him to hell. And there are other vapors that I know that a sleeping man will work their woe, that on a sleeping man will work their woe, but I'll pass on as lightly as I can. Take Cato now. That was so wise a man. Did he not say, take no account of dreams? Now, sir, she said, on flying from these beams, for love of God, do take some laxative. Upon my soul, that's the advice I give for melancholy collar. Let me urge, you free yourself from vapors with a purge, and that you may have no excuse to tarry. From saying this town has no apothecary, I shall myself instruct you and prescribe herbs that will cure all vapors of that tribe, herbs from our very farmyard. You will find their natural pro property to unbind and purge you well beneath and well above. And don't forget it, dear, for God's own love. Your face is caloric and shows distension. Be careful lest the sun in his ascension should catch you full of humors, hot and many. And if he does, my dear, I'll lay a penny. It means a bout of fever on your breath. Of Tartan ague. If you catch, you may catch your death. Worms for a day or two, I'll have to give. As a digestive, then your laxative. Centauri, fumatory, caber spurge, and hellebore, I will make a splendid purge. Then there's laurel, or the blackthorn berry, ground ivy, too, that makes our yard so merry. Pack them right up, my dear, and swallow whole. Be happy, husband, by your father's soul. Don't be afraid of dreams. I'll say no more. Madam, he said, I thank you for your law, but with regard to Cato all the same, his wisdom has no doubt a certain fame, but though he said that we should take no heed of dreams, by God, in ancient books I read, of many a man of more authority than Cato was, believe you me, who say the very opposite is true, and prove their theories by experience, too. Dreams have quite often been significations, as well, of triumphs as of tribulations, that people undergo in this our life, that this needs no argument at all, dear wife. The proof is all too manifest indeed. One of the greatest authors one can read says thus, There are two commands. There, are two com there were two comrades, one who went on pilgrimage, once who went on pilgrimage sincere in their intent, and as it happens, they had reached a town where such a throng was milling up and down, and yet so scanty the accommodation they could not find themselves a habitation. No, not a cottage that could lodge them both, and so they separated, very loath, under constraint of this necessity, and each went off to find some hostelry. 
and lodge whatever way his luck might fall. The first of them found refuge in a stall, down in a yard with oxen and a plow. His friend found lodging for himself somehow elsewhere, by accident or destiny, which governs all of us equally. Now it so happened, long ere it was day, this fellow had a dream, and as he lay in bed, it seemed he heard his comrade call, Help! I am lying in an ox's stall! And shall to-night be murdered as I lie. Help me, dear brother, help, or I shall die. Come in all haste. Such were the words he spoke. The dreamer, lost in terror, then awoke. But once awake, he paid it no attention, turned over and dismissed it as invention. It was a dream, he thought, a fantasy. And twice he dreamt this dream, successively. Yet a third time his comrade came again, or seemed to come, and said, I have been slain. Look, look, my wounds are bleeding, wide and deep. Rise early in the morning, break your sleep, and go to the west gate. There you shall see a cart all loaded up with dung, said he, and in that dung my body has been hidden. Boldly arrest that cart as you are bidden. It was my money that they killed me for. He told me every detail, sighing sore and pitiful, pale of hue. This dream, believe me, madam, turned out true, for in the dream, as soon as it was light, he went to where his friend had spent the night, and when he came upon the cattle stall, he looked about him and began to call. The innkeeper, appearing thereupon, quickly gave answer, Sir, your friend is gone. He left the town a little after dawn. The man began to feel suspicious, drawn by memories of his dream. The western gate, the dung cart, off he went. He would not wait toward the western entry. There he found, seemingly on its way to dung some ground, a dung cart loaded on that very plan described so closely by the murdered man. So he began to shout courageously for right of vengeance on the felony. My friend's been killed. There's been a foul attack. He's in that cart and gaping on his back. Fetch the authorities. Get the sheriff down. Who's, whoever job it is to run the town. Help. My companion's murdered. Sent to glory. What need I add? To finish off the story, people ran out and cast the cart to the, to the ground, and in the middle of the dung they found the murdered man. The corpse was fresh and new. Oh, blessed God, that art, so just and true. Thus thou revealest murder, as we say. Murder will out. We see it day by day. Murder's a foul, abominable treason. So loathsome to God's justice, to God's reason, he will not suffer its concealment. True, things may lie hidden for a year or two, but still, murder will out. That's my conclusion. All the town officers, in great con confusion, seized the car carter and gave him, and they gave him hell, and they racked the innkeeper as well, and both confessed. And then they took the wrecks, and there and then they hanged them by their necks. But this. We see by this we see that dreams are to be dreaded. And in this self same book I find embedded, right in the very chapter after this, I'm not inventing, as I hope for bliss, the story of two men who started out to cross the sea for merchandise, no doubt. But as the winds were contrary, they waited. It was a pleasant town, I should have stated. Merrily grouped about, the haven sighed a few days later with the evening tide. The wind veered round so as to suit them best. They were delighted, and they went to rest, meaning to sail next morning early. Well, to one of them a miracle befell. This man, as he lay sleeping, it would seem, just before dawn, had an astounding dream. He thought a man was standing by his bed, commanding him to wait, and thus he said, if you set sail tomorrow as you intend, you will be drowned. My tale is at an end.